301, Kathy. I don't have All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, with There's Latoya. Okay. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started with our uh, accelerated task force meeting today. This is our fourth meeting. Uh, I want to thank um, all of our task force members and our advisory uh, groups that have been working very hard uh, the last couple of weeks. And thank you for our task force members for joining us today. And uh, I want to thank Superintendent Spearman for joining us today. I know you've been working diligently since our last meeting with the governor and House and Senate members, our legislative staff members, and Accelerate SC on securing funding for continuous learning for our students and hopefully reopening our schools. Um, our task force subcommittees have continued to meet with their advisory groups. Uh, we have received quite a bit of input through our Accelerate Ed website and from our stakeholder groups. I wanna thank all of those that have taken the time to send emails and express your thoughts to the task force. Uh, your input is, is invaluable to us. Uh, I wanna thank the members of the um, task force for their hard work the last couple of days and putting together these recommendations uh, specifically today for our summer learning programs. Uh, and so um, we'll look at the agenda. The first thing I would like to do is um, ask Superintendent Spearman if she would give us an update and, um, and also give us an update on the Accelerate SC task force. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor Coleman. And good afternoon, everyone, and all the folks who are listening in. We appreciate your interest in this. We all, I believe, have the same two goals in mind: to protect our children and our faculty as and their health and safety is our number one goal. And number two is to get our schools opened uh, back to as normal as possible as soon as possible. And blending both of those together is, is quite a challenge, but I appreciate you all helping us work through this and giving us your recommendations. Since we last met, uh, I attended the Accelerate SC committee. As you know, when we began this, our task force, uh, it was a one stop shop <laughs> to go to Accelerate SC to talk with them about our our request for funding from the 1.9 billion CARES Act that's coming to South Carolina, that that committee was to make recommendations on the spending and it was in the governor's hands as to. Since that time, the legislature met and, decide, and, and mandated that the actual appropriation of those funds would have to come from the General Assembly, working with the governor with his recommendations and then uh, we found out now that the um, legislature will be coming back in, it looks like sometime in June, to begin appropriating these funds. I have, I'm scheduled to go next Wednesday to speak before the Senate committee that will be handling this appropriation, and we've already been in contact with them. Uh, so at the last Accelerate SC committee, the resource committee made a recommendation uh, for the spending. Uh, they had and they did uh, recommend, it's not a final recommendation that will come sometimes next week, but their initial recommendation was to fund five days of instructional time, uh, academic recovery, social emotional transition days at the beginning of the school year for kindergarten through eighth grade. Uh, they did also fund uh, a reimbursement amount for the food and labor costs that districts have incurred on their meal plans uh, over the last few months. The funding, this funding covers any kind of uh, expense that has been had since um, the middle of March through December 28th, I believe it is, or the end of this year. It is reimbursable money uh, that for anything that because of the impact of COVID-19. So obviously buying protective equipment is part of that um, and a huge piece on technology. While they did not uh, recommend funding, the request I made for $64 million to cover techno technology devices, they did appropriate a large amount to purchase um, hotspots, 100,000 hotspots uh, to send 80 million toward a broadband uh, expansion and paying for a broadband plan. They do realize, of course, that um, 
now that all goes to the legislature and so things can is still very fluid uh, they did not in the initial um report i uh, had to uh, work with them and the initial uh, recommendation for funding summer school our our request for that uh, expanded summer school was a little over 13 million. That's very far from what I had asked of 115 million. They have asked for us to give additional information on to how many children we really expect to show up. And uh, I believe that, and we have to have that information to them by Tuesday of next, this next Tuesday. So we've been working on a more detailed plan for them as to how we would get that up and running. And I know some of you have districts that are working very hard to, to have a lot of children coming, not just third graders, but K through three. So I'm working hard, been spending a, a lot of my time on making sure that we get the adequate amount, that we have better information, and also that we then receive the adequate funding that we need. I've talked with folks in the Senate, and I, I feel that there is a lot of support there for helping us, but we've got to do our part in getting as much information as I can. And I know it's very difficult because this is definitely one of those chicken and egg situations. You don't know how many children to invite to the camp until you know how much money you got, and they don't know how much money to give us until we know how many children we've got. So it's a difficult situation, but we're gonna be do the best we can. And Dr. Mathis has been working on that and just got off a call with the instructional leaders across the state to survey them and see if we can get a little more finite information. And I promise to you, I will do my part to work as hard as I can to make sure we get the adequate funding that we need to run a high quality program this summer. Um, those, that's basically what has happened. Uh, I had a call yesterday with superintendents. Um, there's a lot of concern about each of these. I think all of us as educators, we've been used to having a lot of flexibility uh, when we get funding. Um, and there are different pots of money that we're dealing with. There's some 30 odd pots of federal assistance that's come down. Each of them have different strings attached. So this particular CARES Act funding is very specific. It is very reimbursable and it has to be spent by the end of the year. Unlike the 194 million that will be going out to districts that has 12 pots that are very open that districts can decide how they spend their money. Uh, they will send that request to the department and then we'll allocate that funding out to them. Now we do plan to have uh, some type of grant template up hopefully within the next two weeks so that we can begin that dialogue with districts as to what they need, how they plan to spend those that 194 million and get that um, money flowing out to the districts just as soon as possible. So I know um, for us, it's very, it is very confusing. There's a lot going on, but I appreciate y'all being willing to take on this task to try to maneuver our way to make sure that the funding that's being spent are being sent is spent for the best bang of the buck and um, and spent properly. So I appreciate it, look forward to hearing your reports and uh, this information that you're giving me will definitely be used uh, as we compile our final remarks that will be given to Accelerate SC and then as I prepare to speak before the Senate on, on next Wednesday. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Spearman. Um, we, we appreciate your, your hard work in the last few days uh, and that information. Uh, next on the agenda uh, is, as you know, we've had some focus groups uh, meeting, and I'm going to ask Ryan Brown to talk about uh, educator feedback that he's uh, put together some information for us. Ryan? Uh, thank you, Dr. Coleman. Um, yes, yeah, just to remind everyone from our discussion last week, uh, we conducted a total of four focus groups, uh, two with parents and two uh, with teachers. Um, you know, focus groups are uh, discussions. They're not intended to provide you know, hard data. Uh, they're what we would call uh, qualitative, not quantitative data. Um, each of those focus groups discussions was done by an independent moderator uh, and lasted roughly an hour and a half apiece. Um, so I'm going to give you the high level, high level overview from the two that we conducted with teachers last week and uh, just kind of share some of the overall feedback. And then I'm going to briefly 
go go back and and identify some of the similarities and differences uh, that we heard with compared to the the group of parents, and then I'm going to do my best to provide some some summary uh, information on some of the emailed feedback that we've been receiving um, since this group began meeting. Uh, so I'm going to start off with talking about remote learning. Um, teachers, uh, like parents, uh, said you know, they voiced their concerns. Um, that it's definitely made you know, made things cha more challenging, particularly uh, with providing instruction to struggling learners. Um, they pointed out a lot of the issues that the state is talking about now with uh, access to the internet, resources, what the home environment is like, and whether or not that's conducive to learning. Um, they did uh, you know, say that there's certainly avenues where the state could improve remote learning. Um, you know, there, there simply is, is no substitute to in-person instruction, and there's simply some students that, you know, will just don't learn well uh, online. Um, and, you know, there, there's very little that we may be able to do to improve that for them. Um, but uh, I think, like parents, that they, you know, they have done the best that they can do, and they're continuing to, um, to do whatever they can to, um, to make the best of it, given the situation. Um, they definitely did also, uh, similar to parents, recognize the need to reduce uh, the number of platforms and just the plethora of information that is out there for online learning um, and really provide a, a streamlined way for that information to get to them and then from them to, to students and parents um, to ensure that they're, they're comfortable with the information being presented. Um, you know, as, as we begin to talk more about actual school operations and less about remote learning, uh, teachers brought up almost immediately uh, the need to prioritize health precautions, uh, things like PPE and disinfectants and how classrooms were being set up. Um, and that was followed you know, very shortly after by uh, the need to get students caught up and, and the support for students to get back in school, whatever the, um, the setting may be. Uh, they they did present some um, some skepticism for some of the things that they you know the ideas have been floating out there, uh, and that would that would include those A B and alternate schedules. Um, that was particularly uh, difficult for them to think about in terms of those that may have younger children at home, uh, where they may be required to teach on the day that that child is not. In a classroom and, and the challenges that would uh, pose to them. Um, they, they were open uh, to summer camps as a, as a model uh, for helping to get some of our struggling learners back up. That wasn't unanimous support, but uh, that was definitely um, the one that were, they were the most open to. Um, uh, it came up time and time again, and, and I'll touch on this in, um, in some of the feedback we've gotten from emails. Uh, testing, the testing that the state does, uh, federal required in the fall, and how that presented an opportunity um, for some added instruction if that testing wasn't there. Uh, that was uh, pretty much unanimously supported uh, from the teachers that participated. Um, in terms of going back a little bit to summer camps, uh, they, again, were supportive of those, definitely noted the precautions that would need to be in place, uh, health and safety precautions. And um, finally, I, I'm going to read this next kind of tidbit verbatim because I, I thought it just kind of spoke to the teaching profession. Uh, and this is from the moderator's remarks. All this being said, one of the most striking takeaways is the resilience and confidence of teachers in their ability to get students caught up. Concerns about health aside, there's very much a we have this attitude among the teachers we spoke with. Teachers are confident that when the time comes, they will be ready to get their students caught up. So I thought that just kind of spoke overall to, you know, what we see in the teaching profession and how they, you know, pretty much in a 24 hour notice have, have changed learning across the state. Um, and the other thing I would note is with, with both of these focus groups and what we're hearing, uh, you know, across the state, there is, you know, more now than you know, probably ever, there is a, an expectation that things won't exactly be normal uh, and there's an openness uh, for, for change. Um, I think, you know, the devil will be in the details there on exactly what that looks like conceptually, uh, but, and there probably won't ever be a complete anonymity for, for support, but um, now more than ever, people are, are open to, to different ideas that are being thrown out there, and um, everyone is very, uh, you know, even in emails uh, and, 
everyone we talk with is is very appreciative of the work that you all have been doing um, and they understand the gravity and importance of it so uh, I thought I would pass that along um, talking about the the emailed feedback um, very similar really remarkably similar to to the feedback from uh, the uh, focus groups that we conducted and we'll we'll make that full both of those full reports uh, available online um, but uh, a lot of concern over you know uh, the health precautions and how that how those that they've seen you know presented by the CDC or uh, by other states how that would impact their particular classroom their particular school setting and just just the notion of how different individual classrooms and individual schools are set up and, and the need for you know really a multitude of options there um, again we, we've We've heard a fair amount about uh, a desire to waive in state state and federal mandated uh, assessments um, and the preference to use that time uh, that's generally allotted for state testing on instruction rather than adding uh, additional school days. Um, so that I think you know very briefly summarizes some of the email feedback from the education community. Um, also, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't touch on. Uh, the arts community, who uh, Patrick can attest, we've we've seen a wave of um, of emailed feedback from them, uh, from arts educators, music orchestra, visual and performing arts teachers, uh, about the importance of uh, continuity in arts based education and the positive impact that the arts have on students' overall experiences. So, I think that feedback will be instrumental, if you will, no pun intended, as we. Um, as we continue to move forward with operations of the fall, but I know uh, Superintendent Spearman as a former music teacher, um, that's something that will uh, certainly be important to you. And uh, given the, the large degree of feedback, I, I felt like I had to had to mention that explicitly. Um, so that that's a very high level uh, overview. Uh, I've, you know, we've gotten hundreds of emails, so I will never be able to fully capture all of that feedback, but again, um, the task force members have that uh, full report and we'll make that report public as well. Thank you, Ryan. And, and Ryan, I apologize, I, I failed to introduce you correctly. Ryan is the communications director for the State Department of Education and has been uh, working on um, compiling this information and looking through the emails and, and talking to the, a lot of the groups. So thank you for that. Any comments or questions for Ryan? All right, next on the agenda. Um, Kathy, Kathy, can I just say sure. one quick thing? Sure. Um, Ryan, thank you for the report. That's fantastic information um, and fantastic pun. Um, just two big takeaways, one to reinforce what you said, and, and one I just want to pull out. One quote that really struck me in the report that you shared with us was from a teacher who noted that this situation is, quote, truly showing the haves and the have nots in our state when it comes to education. Um, and I just think it's important for this task force to keep that in mind as we do our work, but also for state policymakers as we're moving beyond this moment uh, to Ryan's point about how we can't just fall back into the pattern of normal is what he's hearing. We've got to realize that normal also has been inherently inequitable to too many kids for too long. And we need to use this moment as an impetus forward on that. Um, the only other thing I just want to reinforce is what Ryan said. I had the exact same thing underlined about teachers being confident when the time comes that they can get their students caught up. Um, and I just like to encourage us to remember in our work that there's a quote I'd pair with that. I, I talked to our district social worker this week, who I respect a great deal. And she made the comment, and I'm paraphrasing, that if teachers are prepared and supported this fall, they're going to make sure the kids are okay. And I think she's completely on the mark, but we've got to remember that prepared and supported part. I don't want to take that line from the task force report that teachers are confident that they can get it done. They are. They're, they're go-getters by nature, but even a go-getter needs support. And so whether that support is the health protections they need, the learning conditions that they need, the salary support they need to make sure they're not picking up second or third jobs while trying to care for our kids. Those, that's what we got to keep in mind as we start moving forward to the fall. Um, but again, Ryan, thanks for that report. That helps a lot. Dr. Coleman. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Patrick, for those comments. Superintendent. Yeah, Patrick, great comments. Yeah. Are you hearing me okay now? 
Um, I too, uh, that was a great report, Ryan. And I do want to reiterate because I think sometimes, and even I, at, at the beginning of this, we know that we have to teach children how to read. We have to, they have to have numeracy skills. But I know that also one of our challenges is the social emotional support that children need. And we don't need to forget the importance of the arts and those other um, areas of content that for some children are their favorite part of the day when they come to school and are the favorite things. I, I bumped into a student recently and that I taught 25 years ago. She's now a mom with a student in the grocery store. And it made me feel so good. She came up to me to thank me for a song that we used to sing when she was in the third and fourth grade that uplifted her. At the time, she said, Miss Spearman, you don't know what all my family was going through. And I would look forward. And it was a Garth Brooks, the river. <laughs> yeah. So I think that let's don't forget that as we go in for that, as important as learning our reading time, our language arts time, and our math time will be. Uh, it's still important for us to give those children the support they need through the arts and realize that that's how they're going to strengthen their emotional this chasm that they've gone through. <laughs> so I appreciate the fine arts folks speaking out. And Ryan, I, I didn't know you were going to include that in your report, but I'm glad you did. Thank you. Thank you, Superintendent Spearman. Uh, Latoya Dixon, you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to make a brief comment. I want to thank Ryan and uh, Superintendent Spearman and the department for going back and capturing more of the voices of teachers and parents. I know when we started this work, there was concern about our roles and some folks don't always realize that we serve dual roles. We're working on this task force, but we're also teachers or like Patrick, he's also a parent as well as Miss Addison. Uh, but I wanna thank you for capturing their voices and making sure that they were heard uh, and making sure that people understand that that is important to you. That's important to the department. And uh, I'd like to be included in that segment of teachers. I'm a teacher at heart, always will be. And that's my brief comment. I just want to thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. Any other comments at this time? Kathy, I would just add that, you know, this, you know, that was one set of focus groups, but that feedback, of course, from education, educators and, and parents will continue to collect and will continue to um, to report those out to, to you all. And certainly if there is any particular area that you want feedback from, uh, we'll certainly be happy to solicit that from any given audience. All right, thank you for that, Ryan. All right, any other comments? All right, well, next on our agenda is the discussion of the recommendations for summer learning. Again, I'll remind everybody that this uh, these recommendations today, we're going to address summer learning and operations and um, you know, these recommendations are made based on the best information that we have available presently. Uh, they are a snapshot in time and they need to be therefore, you know, if they need to be reconsidered, revised, altered uh, to conform to the latest guidance. Um, we realize that many of these recommendations for the summer um, will apply also to the reopening of schools in the fall. Uh, so, but today our, our goal is to work on our recommendations for summer. So um, what I'd like to do is um, have each subcommittee chair to give an overview of the subcommittee recommendations. They have been compiled in a, in a draft document that you have. Uh, we also sent those to advisory group. We'll take uh, questions and comments from the task force members and make notes of any of the changes uh, that are agreed upon. Uh, so in the document, um, the first uh, recommendations are from the Building and Student Services Subcommittee. So I'll call on Alan Walters, the chair of that subcommittee, to present those. Alan. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. And uh, before I begin, I want to recognize my colleagues on this committee, Dr. Harrison Goodwin, Shonda Jefferson, and Chuck Sailors along with a very fine group of advisory group members from school districts, from outside agencies, 
and other professions, and certainly we have strong support from the State Department staff. Uh, the first thing we want to talk about is just reopening in general. Uh, the main challenge in reopening for summer programs is also the one we're going to face uh, in the fall, and that is having parents, students, and staff feel that it's safe to come back to school. We're not going to get a second chance for a first impression, so we want to make sure we do this right. And so we're encouraging schools and districts, if they don't already have a reopening team in place, uh, they need to form that, and it needs to consist of administrators, staff, but also parents and students were age appropriate. And they need to be considering the processes, the procedures, the protocols. And as we see now, uh, we, we, the guidance seems to be coming up every day uh, with, with new recommendations for it, which is a good thing, but it also means it's gonna require diligence to maintain and keep up with those as they change from day to day. Uh, an example is PPE, and we'll talk about that a little more in a minute, when it should be used, where it should be used, who should be using it. Uh, that's something that's gonna have to be constantly monitored. Uh, as we just heard in, in the survey too, uh, I think this summer you may have some activities that wanna start back up with some of bands and courses or other activities around schools. Where will those take place in the school building? So there needs to be an assessment of the building itself what the needs are for that. Uh, there also needs to be a communications plan that informs stakeholders of what's going on so that they know that not only the staff, but the building is ready to be reoccupied and have people back at school. Um, all these communications should be shared in, in a language that can be understood by all parents. And as I said, this would not only apply to summer programs, it really is leading into the major reopening of school in the fall. One topic we talked about uh, on several occasions, and uh, we're bringing it up again today, is school nurses. We believe that every school should have a school nurse during summer programs. Uh, we realize this will require additional funding in order to do that. Uh, I know there's a survey that's out now that's not complete. I think maybe 10 districts still haven't responded yet, but that has determined that there's approximately 67 schools that have a part-time nurse only and 99 schools that don't have one at all. Now, we're not gonna tackle the issue right now of how do you make a permanent solution for that because that requires recurring funding. But we do believe that funding needs to be available now so that as we start summer programs and into the fall while we're in this pandemic crisis, that there is a school nurse in every school, you know, and the, I think the analogy we used before was the, the comparison to school resource officers and the move to put one in every school. And I would submit to you that our school nurses are health resource officers and play an equally vital role in protecting our children, staff, and uh, visitors. Cleaning, the superintendents talked about that. The funding is being worked on. Uh, as we've seen, there's uh, an Appendix has been submitted to this draft report from DHEC on the latest guidance for that. Uh, schools or districts are going to have to determine now if they have the staff and equipment to do this themselves or if they're going to have to contract that out. But again, funding will be there for that. The superintendents asked for it. Uh, also, another thing that came up during our discussions is equipment. There's a lot of specialized equipment now it's been recognized and that uh, the state certainly would have buying power to get more of that so they could get out to the schools. Uh, there's cleaning equipment that can be used. It can clean a whole classroom, of an atomizer type thing in a matter of minutes. So we're encouraging that. Also with the state's buying power is the PPE and uh, the Accelerate SC Task Force, my understanding, has recommended $16.7 million for a state stockpile. Uh, I know Superintendent Spearman made a request, I think, of $159,000 just for masks to be distributed statewide. One thing we want to be careful of with this is that some of these terms are getting tossed around and being used interchangeably when they're not. For instance, with masks, uh, some of the cloth masks that are used mainly are to uh, protect others from the wearer, whereas N95s or others have a different purpose for that. But there seems to be some 
misunderstanding that uh, people wearing cloth masks are you know, not just protecting themselves, but they're being protected from others as well. So we think some education also has to go along with that and what each piece of equipment does and also how to properly use it. Uh, we do a lot of training each year of bloodborne pathogens and use of masks and how to properly put on and take off gloves. And that's got to be applied to this as well. Uh, I think we have the appendix B in this draft report covers the latest DHEC recommendations. Um, another one for us that was uh, hugely important is mental health. We're advocating that uh, there be a mental health crisis response team in every school and that there's a triage protocol. Uh, that's going to be important this summer as we bring children back and we're trying to prepare them to get into the full time learning environment of the new school year. Uh, those teams should include school counselors, special education staff, uh, it could be outside agency therapists, teachers, our school nurse, uh, administrators, but they need to be trained in trauma awareness. Um, there probably needs to be a district liaison that could be appointed to communicate directly with the State Department to gather and access new uh, available resources as these things are coming online, like we say, we think this is going to be a real ongoing need that has to be addressed. The triage protocols needed to assist in identifying individuals, and it's not just students, but also staff who may require interventions at various levels besides just a basic check in. And so those that need additional support would be processed through a protocol for referral uh, to services either within the school or district or possibly outside services. We've talked a lot also about the social and emotional uh, learning and check in. Uh, we believe the school staff should have social emotional support and processing prior to the students returns. Uh, students certainly should have access to SEL and school wide programs uh, and plans embedded in the classroom. But there does, in fact, need to be that initial check in in order to process any trauma from this COVID-19 pandemic and also from the fact they've been out of school so long. Uh, there's a lot of re free resources that are available, and uh, we advocate that those be vetted and posted by the State Department. Special education, uh, we think that an assessment needs to be done to determine if services can be provided in compliance with social distancing guidelines, and if there are appropriate alternative services available. Uh, once this impact of disclosure has been assessed, there's going to, have to be IEP teams determining needs for recovery services. Um, decisions made about how do you provide services for students with disabilities who are medically fragile or who just may not be able to return to school. Um, districts are going to have to make decisions and determinations about compensatory services uh, where there may not have been special education related services to students with disabilities during that closure. Safety protocols, uh, we want to make sure that this also covers uh, safety protocols to allow potential English learners to be identified using the Every Student Succeeds Act approved screening tools. And the district should also try to screen students who are provisionally identified during the spring school closure. And then we want to talk about athletics for a moment. Uh, I know there was an announcement made yesterday about recreation league uh, activities. And uh, we've been working with the high school league and Commissioner Singleton. Uh, they have drawn up a draft of a three phased approach that would begin in conjunction uh, with the restarting of group academic activities in districts or schools. Uh, they include the use of face masks, social distancing, uh, facility and equipment cleaning protocols, uh, as well as other considerations. Uh, it's a pretty extensive document. And we have submitted that as Appendix C for this report uh, would have those full guidelines in it. Uh, now, my understanding, too, that is still a work in progress and that hopefully within the next week or so, uh, the high school league will be ready to announce their recommendations. And I think that has covered our report. All right, thank you, Alan. Uh, are there any other comments from your your subcommittee? All right. Question, um, Dr. Coleman. Yes, yes. 
I, I just got some information, Alan, while, while you were giving your report, and which, which is very, very good. Um, I think it's really interesting, and, and you said it in the meeting last week, how for the last decade or so, we've been really doing risk management around um, active shooters coming into a school and, and have placed school resource officers in every school that and, and drills and all the focus there that this is the same type of risk management now, but it's around the health of our students. So obviously, we've always needed school nurses, but we need them even more now. So we have been conducting a survey uh, that we were awaiting all the districts to respond to. And Virgie Chambers just texted me while, while you were reporting that we got the preliminary data from that. And it looks like uh, there are about 123 schools in the state that have no nurse at all. There are included in that about 75 that have part-time. There are 198 schools that do not have a full-time nurse. So I think um, your recommendation on a nurse in every school, a full-time nurse in every school would be very, is, is a great one that we need to take. I need to take that as I speak to uh, the legislature next week and you know as we plan for what needs to be done because surely just as important as having a resource officer in every school now, every school needs a full-time nurse there. So um, thank you for pushing us on that. And thanks to Virgie and those. We'll be getting that information out to you. I think we can break that down by district to show where those needs are. So that's something we'll, we'll need to be looking at very closely. I think yesterday also on the call with superintendents, uh, there was a concern mentioned about students that uh, really have severe health issues and how do we serve them knowing that for some of them it may, you know, almost be impossible for them to come back into a, a regular school setting. And I mentioned to the superintendents, I think we need to be, we need to have information readily available to give to families on other options. Some may need to be in an all virtual program for their school and some districts have those, but uh, there are charter public charter schools that allow a total virtual experience. So we need to have that information available for families across South, South Carolina if that is the best choice for their students. So I, I'd like if you all would consider that uh, and adding that as something that we need to supply. I, I'm going to be recommending that and I'd appreciate your support on it. Alan, you want to comment on that? I think that's a, a very valid point and I think that uh, my fellow committee members wouldn't have any problem with that at all. Thank you. Um, any other any other comments? Uh, from anyone on the task force. Uh, Dr. Coleman, I've got a quick yes, clarification. Sir. Uh, to uh, Superintendent Spearman, Molly, uh, we've got 190 plus teachers, I mean, excuse me, nurses that are needed. Do we have any idea what a cost would that would, for that would be? Thank you, Chuck. Uh, an average, we're figuring salary and fringe somewhere around six, I'll just loosely say around 60,000, 60 to 62,000 each. Okay, thank you very much. Yes. That's correct. Yeah. And Chuck, if I, if I could jump in there too, I, just so that uh, if it was to bring people in on a temporary basis for like the summer programs or something until this could be fully addressed, it breaks down to about $300, $310 a day, I think. Well, if we're going to the Senate with uh, requests for funding, I would rather go for the full time than the part time. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments? All right. Next on the uh, uh, next section of the draft recommendations is from the instructional subcommittee. So I'm going to ask Patrick Kelly, chairman of that subcommittee, to present those recommendations. 
Thank you, Dr. Coleman. And like Alan did, I'd just like to lead by thanking the other members of our subcommittee, uh, Tanya Addison with Willie Dixon and Sherry East. Uh, we've had multiple meetings and robust conversation about the summer. Um, we're also fortunate to have a fantastic group of, of advisory group members, um, and we're, we're happy with the product that we've been able to um, put together for the summer. Um, and, and I emphasize this is about the summer. I know that a lot of the discussion in the public space around instructional related things right now are about the fall, about how does school reopen? What does the schedule look like? Is it AB? Is it AM, PM? This is summer rec, so we didn't get to that. So, but we are digging in on that with the fall recommendations that'll come next. Um, and so we've taken our summer recommendations and put them into four categories um, with the acronym LIFT. Um, focused on learning, identification, formulation, and transition. Because um, we think those are the four activities that districts should focus on most heavily over the summer. Um, and, and starting off with learning, um, a couple of things that, to emphasize from our recommendations, because that's the most robust section of this um, recommendation set since we're the instruction subcommittee. Um, we did recommend for districts to continue with regular um, reading camps for third graders and summer programs for middle and high as able. Um, but we followed that with a recommendation about format for summer learning experiences for students. Um, and we indicated that we recommend districts use um, the form delivery format that best aligns with their capabilities, um, whether that be virtual, blended, in-person, uh, reading packets, lots of different options there. But we emphasize that while the digital format can be effective for middle and high, we strongly recommend against its use any summer programs, whether traditional reading camp or other for elementary age learners. Um, we didn't feel like that was consistent with best practices. Um, that was reemphasized in the report that Ryan shared, that there's a lot of fatigue uh, with elementary kids and e-learning, and they're having a harder time adjusting to it than our older learners are, which we could have probably anticipated. Um, as a result, we, we recommended that the preference for non-virtual for younger learners may necessitate districts changing the schedule of summer learning programs to try to push them back later in the summer to see if um, that helps uh, it, the health situation, because we, we emphasize that no matter what, although face-to-face -face is um, preferred, we want to make sure that any learning environment is based on what is permitted and appropriate under current health guidance from DHEC and the CDC. Um, and we also noted that if districts feel like they cannot meaningfully pull off um, summer recovery learning using some of the um, federal funding streams that Superintendent Spearman mentioned, that it may be better to think about using those dollars in the fall than having an online learning environment for um, especially our early learners during the summer. Um, if in-person learning is not available, we also provided some recommendations around some things that districts um, could think about to be creative that we haven't done in the past. One of them is to look at hiring individual tutors for students with the most identified um, needs. And we'll talk about identification in a second. Um, and we highlighted that those tutors specifically, um, if trained appropriately, a great pool of resources would be our pre-service teachers. Um, we know many of them had interrupted experiences during the spring, um, whether it's practicums or internships, um, but that's a lower risk health category their future educators so we can build our teaching workforce, support them with summer employment and provide specialized one-on-one -on -one instruction or small group instruction for students. Um, we also said that districts should consider using summer uh, recovery funds to look at buying text and resource for students, have summer reading challenges and put books directly into the hands of students. Um, after that, we made recommendations around learning, encouraging districts to address specific subgroups of students. We acknowledge that every single student in South Carolina has been impacted and felt an effect of, of um, school closure on their learning, but we know that certain subgroups have been more um, directly affected. And so specifically, we have um, recommendations around um, additional supports for um, students in special education and our English language learners. So similar to the recommendation from Allen's committee, um, we emphasize the importance of putting high priority on our K through three learners because of all the research about the importance of early learning, both in the areas of literacy and in the areas of um, mathematics. 
Uh, we also pulled out as a special subgroup um, our career and technical students at the high school level um, in particular. We know several of them were unable to um, engage in the kind of one-on-one -on -one licensing experiences that they may need for their um, career and technical programs. So we emphasize that districts could look at using um, summer recovery as health situations permit for one-on-one -on -one or small group instruction to meet those requirements that couldn't be completed in the spring. Um, Overarching all of that, our learning recommendations wrapped with two recommendations for the State Department, one of them specific to resource development um, and helping uh, districts with developing resources that can be deployed both in person or at home. Um, and the second one around communications, um, going back to our very first task force meeting and emphasizing the need for a public relations campaign this summer to emphasize summer reading. Um, and we, we talked about how the State Department can partner with local libraries, local media to try to encourage that work. Um, those are our learning recommendations. Uh, in the area of identification, what we're focused on is recommendations to districts to help them strategically prepare um, for the fall by identifying priorities and student needs. Um, and so our first recommendation in the area of identification is for districts to strategically use all the data that's been gathered over the last three months on student learning um, to some degree grades, but more specifically the documentation that we know that teachers and other educators have done around student engagement levels or non engagement levels and for where districts have documentation of student non engagement. We want districts to identify those learners as the ones with potentially the greatest needs rolling into the fall. Um, once students have identified their learners, um, we recommend that if they have the capacity in July to do some limited one on one or small group uh, diagnostic testing with students that they seek to do so, so that we can have as much actionable data as possible going into the fall, because we know some of our typical data streams from the spring, whether it be tests that didn't happen or grades that are not the normal grade situation because of adjustments made during closure. Um, so if districts can try to get in front of building robust data in the summer um, to try to do so. Um, and again, we recommend specific focus on student subgroups that we know have probably been most affected by closure, um, specifically our, our young learners in K through two, our transition grades from five to six and eight to nine, our English learners, our migrant or homeless students, um, and students with IEPs or those that are in progress of being evaluated for eligibility um, under IDEA. Uh, our next chunk of recommendations is formulation. Um, and by that word, we mean we want districts to formulate plans for the fall because we think it's essential that a big part of work over the summer is making sure that we're ready for the fall because we know that business as usual summer activities are not going to get it done for a fall that will be anything but business as usual as we open up schools. Um, so the first recommendation in, in the formulation category is for district and state leaders to prioritize broadband access. Um, as Superintendent Spearman said, uh, some of that is being addressed through uh, the recommendations of Accelerate SC, uh, but we, we put heavy emphasis on trying to close the digital divide when it comes to device access for students and for teachers who do not have school supplied um, broadband devices um, and providing learning management systems for our districts that don't have them. Um, our second recommendation um, was around prioritization of professional learning experiences. Um, we, we know that um, PD always should be relevant, teacher driven, collaborative and rich in opportunities for re reflection and feedback. But we think that's even more true this summer and so we emphasize professional learning in three big areas, distance learning and instruction, social and emotional learning, and trauma-informed practices. We think that those are three areas that will be critically important for equipping our teachers um, with the, the skills and info they need to meet the unique needs of our learners this fall. Um, our third recommendation under formulation for districts is for districts to start building a contingency plan for fall 2020 in case of a resurgence of COVID-19. Um, we laid out a couple of minimal requirements or minimal asks for those plans, including um, building distance learning procedures and schedules for gr by grade level, building a communications plan for how to share that with parents and students and community members, um, and developing methods to track student engagement in the event of 
another extended e-learning period. Um, and then we wrapped up formulation again with a couple of recommendations specifically for the State Department, um, specifically looking at some state regs that could be waived to try to help schools in the event that we end up in an e-learning environment again. Uh, the first is around defined minimum program language um, for specific courses. Number two is um, attendance intervention requirements, especially important for e-learning since traditional methods of capturing attendance don't really work. And number three is around seat time for high school courses, because again, it's harder to measure seat time in an e-learning environment. And then our final area of recommendations fell in the um, umbrella of transition. Uh, and these are specifically four recommendations to help um, districts transition into the new learning environment in the fall. Um, and they're all four for um, state level recommendations. Number one and number two, um, walk hand in hand with each other. They're for the State Department to continue the work that they have already begun on developing learning progressions um, and to develop essential readiness standards. Um, we think that's in critically important because the reality is we can't ask teachers to walk into 2020-2021 and teach 100% of the content standards for their course and the 25% of the standards for the course that happened the spring before. So we've got to equip our teachers with, with guidance and support in identifying what to prioritize um, in the coming school year. Um, the third recommendation is one that Ryan mentioned as having unanimous consent with the task force, or not with the task force, the focus group. Um, and it had unanimous support from our um, subcommittee, which is for the State Department to seek necessary waivers from accountability related testing requirements at both the federal and state level for um, the coming school year. Um, we view that as critically important to um, opening up additional time for instruction, and also reducing stress on students that are already walking into the school year stressed enough as it is. Um, and then our final recommendation in transition is for the State Department to consider ways to expand virtual SC options um, to younger grades. I'm going to points that have already been made. We anticipate the likelihood um, of even if we're quote unquote normal operations in the fall, which is obviously to be determined, but even in that event, um, we agree with the, the statements that we should anticipate parents having some students that they do not want to send back to school and we need to have resources to support them. But those resources cannot be a situation where we ask a classroom teacher to in effect prepare a regular lesson plan and an e-learning lesson plan in the same day because they have some kids physically at school and some kids that aren't. So we've got to build resources out. Um, so that's that's our, our four, our learning identification formulation and transition. Um, Dr. Coleman, if there's any questions or if any of my other subcommittee members have something to add, uh, we'd love to hear it. All right, thank you, Patrick. Any comments from the members of the subcommittee. I just want to again uh, reiterate a lot of what we've talked about that needs to be done uh, when students return or even late this summer can be done if we're able to get those five days. Uh, we can do some of those things during those five days. Those are things that we normally do once school starts. And if I remember in my classroom in a middle school English as a middle school English teacher. Uh, you do, you're doing a lot of those operational pieces. You're checking in with the special education teacher for those students who are in your inclusion classroom. You're checking in perhaps with parents who want to alert you to a particular uh, context about their child. And so I think those five days can be really useful in helping us get ahead of the curve, so to speak, and getting our students ready. And we've even talked about in our district uh, having some transition where our students get some closure time with their teacher from this year and they get some bonding time with their teacher for next year and how we could do that. And so uh, I think there's a lot of creative ways those can be used. And I just wanna thank publicly Patrick Kelly. He's been an outstanding leader for this committee and I wish I could work with him every day uh, as well as Miss Addison and Sherry East. Uh, and I have worked with Miss Addison very closely in my role at the department, but I, I have to say, Patrick, I thank you for your leadership. Thank you, Latoya. Um, and and I really like Patrick, if I may, the fact that you um, addressed a lot of planning that really needs to happen 
the summer before you go into the fall. And those are very important recommendations. Any other comments or questions? Dr. Cole, <coughs> the task force. If I, if I may, yes, 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 yeah, your committee's done a great job. Thank you for your leadership. I did have a question <coughs> under identification. Uh, is it just, was there um, under identification number one, number three, given limited time and resources, the district should give highest priority. Um, did you, is it just a typo that you left out third graders or was there, tell me your rationale for that. Uh, mm -hmm. Just because as we look at summer school, uh, Dr. Mathis and I have been talking and depending on the funding that we might get for summer school, helping, mm -hmm advising districts on setting their priority for who should come. Could you talk about that a little bit? Because we actually were going the other way, third grade, second grade, first grade, as far as attending summer school. Yes, ma'am. Uh, and, and I invite, invite my subcommittee members to definitely correct me if I'm off the point with this. Um, but the omission of third grade there is not um, because we think that third grade shouldn't be included. It's felt because we felt like third grade was already addressed through reading camp programs um, at, on a normal basis. So we were trying to pull out groups that otherwise wouldn't be a priority area. Um, but obviously, since the passage of Read to Succeed, third grade has been a priority area. Um, so we would have no objection to the inclusion, I don't think, of third grade there. Um, because it wasn't the intent to exclude for any specific reason. It was because we thought read to succeed kind of captured that. Right. I got, I appreciate that. Um, I know Dr. Mathis has been talking with the instructional leaders around the state prior to this call, and they're working feverishly to really give us a good estimate of how many children they have identified to attend. And then hopefully we'll have enough funding that we can cover all of them. But, uh, you know, we were looking at them. If not, then how would you prioritize? So that's why I asked, but thank you. Thank you, Ms. Spearman. Any other comments or questions for Patrick? All right. Uh, next on the agenda are the recommendations from the Operations Subcommittee. I'll ask Scott Turner, the chair of that sub subcommittee, to present those recommendations. Thank you, Dr. Coleman. Um, just to recognize the members of um, our subcommittee was Missy Campbell, Sherry Applesheimer, and Brian Newsom. Um, Molly, the first thing on our um, recommendations had to do with finance. So the information shared um, as we started our meeting came as quite a shock. Um, that the Accelerate SC is only um, looking at giving you 10% of what you requested. For us in Greenville County, that would mean we would have to disinvite around a thousand students that we've already planned to serve this summer. Um, so that's quite disappointing. Um, everything we've done to this point has been in terms of planning summer programs and to um, Anticipate trying to pull it off with 13 million versus 115 million. I'm not sure that's possible. Um, so whoever or whomever you need to relay that information to, I hope you can do that. So that covers the finance piece. <laughs> well, and if, if we may, Dr. Coleman, if I might just respond. Uh, Absolutely. I spoke with the chairman of the committee uh, several times and again this morning, and I don't I don't think there's uh, any doubt in their mind the importance of this, but there was some question about the numbers and and of course, as they have appropriated their money, uh, things are changing as, every day, even while they were giving their report um whatever whatever day that was Monday, I guess. Um, we realize there's an additional fund that now has been sent that will pay for testing. And they had appropriated 20 million to reimburse for testing in nursing homes where it looks like that's gonna be covered by another pot of money. So I, I feel confident that if I can give them some better information and help them with the confidence that we can make this happen this summer, <laughs> 
that they're going to do everything they can to up that amount. And, and as I go to the Senate, I, I feel like we have a lot of support there because in the continuing resolution that the House and Senate passed, as well as the governor signing Monday night, it directed the department to work on expanded summer programming for our students, particularly those K through three students. So they've already voted almost unanimously on that in the General Assembly. So I feel very good about going to them asking for more funds, but I'm gonna let them know what you said. And I hope that you all will, as you come in contact with legislators now, just talk about that. It would be helpful. Thank Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so going back to finance, if we were to get that, we were recommending um, a dollar amount of at least $2,500 per student, and that would be all inclusive of all the costs surrounding operating the summer camps, um, transportation, custodial services, salaries, instructional supplies. Um, also asking the State Department to allow district flexibility to purchase items um, necessary to provide summer camps within the bounds of district and state procurement regulations. Um, under the human resources or personnel record, we list summer camps where I was to have a, a student teacher ratio of between 12 or 16 to 1, um, to also have an instructional aid in each classroom, nurses, custodians, bus drivers, and administrators. Um, we discussed um, employee application packets for summer school and staff, including screening check questions and really a messaging campaign around not only the employees, but students and families so they could self assess themselves daily based on a set of questions in terms of reporting to work or report, reporting to school that day based on their um, possible exposure. Were they running a fever? Do they have a cough? Do they not feel well? Um, a messaging campaign by each school to their families around those types of items, um, including professional development days for our staff members um, who will be running the camps um, to train on the safety and health protocols and social distancing and food service, instructional programs, um, also professional development surrounding um, social emotional learning for our students once they return. In, ter in terms of food service recommendations, we were glad to hear that the USDA extended the um, ability to continue serving meals this summer. So that was a relief to be able to continue serving um, two meals a day to the students who do attend these summer camps. Um, we did recommend that if, ca if a cafeteria is large enough with few enough students that students could eat in the cafeteria, um, if not providing social distancing there, then consider eating in classrooms um, where you could isolate more students. In terms of transportation, we are still waiting on some more refined information from DHEC regarding um, capacities of our buses. Um, and I think that information is coming either later this week or early next week. Um, that again will be a major um, Will limit our capabilities to, based on their determination on how what is the capacity of a, of a bus. Uh, maybe not so much this summer, but as we look to the fall. Um, so we're looking forward to getting that information from DHEC and from the State Department officials. As far as school site recommendations, we're, we're recommending the signage and having um, designated entrances and exits um, and everyone uh, go through the um, protocols of how to enter and exit buildings, ensure communication with staff and students and regularly shared regarding the expectations of self-assessments. Again, we talked about the screening questions, um, access control measures to include designated entrances um, designed for one-way traffic, PPE for staff and students where social distancing measures are not possible, reduce the sharing of um, resources. Consider um, leaving doors um, open when possible and security allows so that you reduce touching of door handles. Uh, media center doors left open, 
if books are unshelved by students and not checked out, leaving them in a designated area for a period of time so they can be disinfected before they're shelved again. Um, during recess, um, if, during social distance, and we realize they need those breaks, if they do use equipment, it will have to be disinfected after use. Um, no visitors um, past the capture area in the building. If a parent needs to enter the campus for some type of conference, then they should be screened with those screening questions. Uh, consider a limit on field trips or possible not having field trips, depending on what the capacity of the buses would be on uh, transportation and if social distancing is, is still practical. And the last item was under cleaning and sanitation. We're just um, disinfecting high touch surfaces frequently throughout the day and um, professional development and training, not only for our custodial staff, but also teachers and aides in terms of, you know, disinfecting high touch areas within classrooms frequently. That was it for our committee. Thank you, Scott. Any comments from other members of the subcommittee? Uh, Ms. Spearman? Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you, Scott, and, and and it could be others on the on the full committee might know this. As far as the training for custodial staff, uh, those folks are going to be using the sanitizing equipment. Is that something that the department could help with so that it's delivered on in a uniform way? Or how are you in Greenville County planning that or Georgetown? Is that done by your supplier of the supplies? Or just give me some background on, on what you think, how you're planning on handling that in your district. We already have um, the equipment and supplies at each location. Again, we were already planning to have these summer schools at. 49 locations. <laughs> do it. We're going to make it happen. We're going to make it happen. Um, we were, um, so we have the cleaning supplies at the locations for classrooms, but also our, our building services folks will have, we have the electrostatic cleaners as well. Um, and also the disinfectant capabilities, the hand sanitizers, all those things have been delivered. We've ordered and, and have in place in order to accommodate being able to do that. Yeah, we're in the process. Uh, I knew that Greenville had already done being so large. We are collecting information from the smaller districts and trying to order on their behalf. But what about Georgetown, Alan? What have y'all done down there? We, we do our in-house training also. Uh, we've got electrostatic cleaners. Um, we, we got those during flu season before this got started. So we were fortunate there. Uh, the, the cleaner's hard to to come by right now, but certainly we, we do an annual training and with specific equipment, uh, we'll have the vendor come in and do additional training. We've moved our uh, data safety sheets to an online base. And so I think we're in good shape, but I know there are a lot of districts that uh, may not be at that level that Greenville or, or Georgetown is. And so I think some consistency in training that would go out uh, would be beneficial to them. And frankly, also, you got to keep in mind that uh, it's a liability issue, too. So if there's state offered training, I think that would reduce liability for districts. Yeah, I was wondering if that's something that we might ought to consider doing through our Office of School Facilities or or someone to provide it uniformly so that those that may not have quick access. Harrison, what about what are you doing up in Chesterfield? on training for custodial staff, that kind of thing? Are you Have you already got that taken care of, or do you see that as a need for some of our smaller districts? Uh, Molly, we, we obviously do training annually uh, on a recurring basis, and would the plan would be to do that additional training. Our issue is going to be uh, personnel, just to be honest. Uh, we're probably going to have to go out and find a way to bring people in um, to, to help us. We, uh, like many districts, we run on a lean budget there, and there are going to be things that we just can't do with what we currently have in place. Yeah. yeah. And that well, was part of our recommendation was that it included contracted services because uh, the need's greater right now, but hopefully things will get better and it won't be that way. And so 
uh, without having that recurring cost. Yeah, thank you. Okay, well, that's helpful. Thank you. We'll keep talking with districts, but I, I would like for the department, I think it's our responsibility as much as we can to provide training services, um, helping to collect the purchasing. Um, you know, we don't really have staff designated for that, but we could use part of our, um, our CARES Act funding to cover that kind of staffing and, and assistance. So we'll look at that. But great report. Thank you, Scott. And I, I pledge to you, Scott, that we're going to have your 49 site locations having summer programs. All right. We got to, I got, got to work on my report. <laughs> Molly, remember, I'm listening too. Thank you, Chuck. <laughs> and for the rest of the state as well. Um, it's, it's important. And I, I think Patrick said it a minute ago. Um, virtual has been wonderful. Thank goodness for all this great technology. But for those children who are learning to read and they're struggling, uh, they need to be sitting with a great teacher. It's maybe six feet apart, but we need to get them back with the teacher just as soon as possible. And that's why I'm so excited and really want to see this summer uh, recovery camp happen. Thank you, Molly. Uh, Shonda, you have a question? Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you all for um, our reports. I had a quick question for Scott um, about the human resources personnel recommendations um, for the summer camp staff. And it says should include, but is not limited to. I think all of the subcommittees have mentioned the importance of the social emotional supports, but is it possible uh, that we could mention a counselor in that list uh, as well? Uh, so yes. we would have I the counselors available for the students, um, you know, since we all mentioned social emotional supports, I think it's worth having them mentioned in that list as well. Thank you for that. Uh, we, that was an oversight. We did mention guidance counselors and, I, and we will get that in there. Thank you so much. Uh, if I could Thanks, make Shonda. one comment. Sure. Um, one thing Shonda and I both were on a, a different meeting just before we came on here. And one of the most interesting things that I've heard, and it goes back to the importance of us having the summer camps or summer school, is that we cannot come back into next school year trying to catch students up on content and standards that they missed last year. If we use that time during the, the return to school, What's going to happen is we're going, going to be perpetually behind. What we need to do is first use the summer camp or, or summer school to help move those children who are most struggling up. And then we need to incorporate whatever they might have missed last year in this year's standards. And I think that that was a real important point that I took earlier today, Shonda, that uh, if you don't, you're you're perpetually behind and we can't afford that. Percent agree with that, and just the reiteration and stress of the importance of those social emotional supports for students. School. So those were two main takeaways from our meeting um, prior to this meeting with the SREB. Thank you, Harrison. Thank you, Shonda. Uh, Latoya, you have a comment? Just a brief comment, you know, Shonda, I'm listening to you talk about the social emotional learning. That too, I know we talked uh, among our subcommittee, is something that's very important that could happen with those five days superintendent experiment that you've talked about. That's a time for us to work with students on the front end and get them ready and know their situations. And traditionally what happens when we go back to school is we, we're spending those first five days anyway, trying to do those things that we have to get done. This gives us an opportunity to get ahead of the game. But the comment I, I wanted to make, and I'll try to keep this brief, is I listened to you say that there was some uncertainty about whether or not districts could pull off some reading camp. Well, this is certainly a challenge. Uh, I think a dual challenge for me, I'm in a brand new position. And while I've done a lot of different kind of work, I've never been responsible for executing summer reading camp. But I have no doubt that the districts and my colleagues who I've talked to across the state are already planning. Some of them are ready. They're waiting on these recommendations and they are ready to go. They're already ready. 
they're ready. Others of us who are new to the work are getting a lot of good support from our superintendent and we are just about ready to go too. So I want to say publicly that I think there is a lot of confidence in the work that our teachers do and can do. And I have no doubt that if we are given the opportunity to provide summer op opportunities for learning to our children, we will more than pull it off. We will do it very well. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Um, Amen. Thank you, Latoya. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, I didn't ask her to say that either. I want folks to know that was <laughs> but I appreciate yeah. it. That's the kind of enthusiasm and dedication we need. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Patrick, you have a comment? Yes, ma'am. Thank you all. I maybe should pull it back after that. I, I learned at a young age, you don't go after the altar call, so I, I may need to back off. Uh, but just, just one thing to Harrison's point about we can't catch up if we are, if we don't, if we go, you said it as if we are trying to catch kids up from spring 2019, we'll perpetually be behind. I agree completely. And the only thing I would add on to Latoya's point is that's why it's also going to be critically important that we prioritize time within the school year next year and we knock down the barriers to student learning time that exist. Uh, we, we've emphasized the um, standardized testing waiver request. That is a way to gain back massive amounts of time. Um, and we need to think strategically as we move into our fall recommendations about how do we repurpose the time that we have in 2020, 21 to prioritize learning over everything else, over compliance, over documentation. How do we give time, kids time on task and teachers time instructing? That's how that's another way that I think we can address the challenge that Harrison just pointed out. That, That's a good that comment. comment. Yeah, yes. great comments, Patrick. Oh, I appreciate that. One thing I'd like to hear you all discuss just briefly, and I know our time's coming to an end, but in order for children to come back, whether it's summer school or in the fall, we have got to build the confidence of the parents and grandparents to send that, that they're safe. Uh, and I know, uh, Alan, you mentioned a little bit about a public service announcements and that kind of thing and communication, but um, do you all have any other thoughts on that? Uh, even let's talk about just for summer school. I mean, we're talking about probably July 6th, somewhere in that after right after the 4th of July. <clears throat> so if you have any thoughts off the top of your head now or over the weekend to help us, how do we build the confidence to everyone, teachers and families alike, that um, we're going to be ready and and it's safe for them to attend school. Molly, could I uh, offer something? As well as a comment and a question, um, the ability to build confidence and support with the community comes back to the fact that the parents, the community, understands that the buildings are safe and secure. We all agree on that. My question to follow up into your request is, do we have any idea if the C, if the uh, if DHEC or the governor's office is going to change any of the current requirements for distancing in place within a structure or within social groups? The reason I ask that is because if we follow the current DHEC guidelines, our spaces are limited. We're planning toward that now. If there is any indication that they're going to be making adjustments as we get closer to summer uh, reading camps and to the opening of school in the fall, that would be helpful to at least have an understanding of what could happen so this group and our school districts could uh, plan accordingly. Now, that's one question real quick. Another one that has nothing to do with what you're asking, but it follows back to the funding a few minutes ago that was discussed. Are there any other little bombshells out there that might be coming up to where you have asked for 115 million and somebody's gonna give you roughly 10%? Is there any other areas that you're concerned about in that regard as well? Well, I'll take the last question first. Uh, as far as the funding, I, I think that absolutely, um, with the, when the General Assembly came back and took their responsibility to say we were, we are the ones who need to appropriate that funding. I had placed all my 
request and, and was attending, you know, Accelerate SC. So we definitely have another step to go. Uh, it's a very friendly body. Uh, they're very, very supportive of public education. They're very concerned about the loss of instruction time. I've had conversations with several House members and senators who, who they get it and they know this is serious and that we need some really quality time with students. So that's why I feel I feel very confident, Chuck, that we're going to be able to ask them and receive what we need. But I can't, I'm not, you know, it's not, I'm 100%, I can't give you 100% confidence on that until after we go Wednesday and talk. But I, can, I will say to you, my initial conversations to them have been very, very strong and good because the things that we're talking about, these five days and the summer school money, additional summer school money, we're going to have to upfront that from the Department of Education because this money that we're talking about has to be reimbursable. And so through the continuing resolution, they have given the state superintendent the authority and the department to move funds around so that we could upfront this money. <laughs> and then be able to pay, you know, reimburse. So the steps are already in place and initial conversations that I've had with them, I feel very good about it. But, you know, you never 100% till you get there and you see it, and the fat lady sings at the end of the show. You know? <laughs> so, well, but I do feel really good. And I don't think, no, I don't think that there are any other big issues. Uh, I will share with you all one change for the district's funding. So, and I think some of you probably know this, <clears throat> that the guidance from the US Department of Education on the 194 million did change, not substantially, but we were given the guidance that now the funding that the state and the districts receive should include an allocation for the private school students and parochial school students. I had a conversation with uh, the head of their associations uh, this afternoon, and we're working with them. Um, you know, it's controversial for some, but I will tell you, here's how I look at it. We are very fortunate that the federal government is sending us lots of recovery money, and it's going to public governments, it's going to private businesses as well, and clearly, our independent schools here in the state have been very effective. The parochial schools have taken a hit. They've had to supply, um, they've had to supply e-learning just like we have. They've had to foot the bill for that. So while it's based on the number of private school students in the state, but uh, we are planning on working, we are working with them to make sure that it's done in a very um, efficient way and that it meets their needs as well. So you all need to under, need to know that too. Uh, it's not a substantial amount of funding somewhere uh, between around at least 14 million, uh, probably a little higher because of the we're we're working on getting an accurate count now of what that funding would be. But uh, that there is a percentage of that that will be shared with our independent schools. So the 14 million, for the lack of a better number would be taken off the top proportionally by district before the districts receive their funding. Well, we're working on that right now to see how the initial guidance that we were given is that it would depend on the location of the school, knowing that some of those students may come from other districts, but it would be the responsibility of that local district. Uh, and then it's not a check that's written. It's not direct funding that flows to their schools, but it's for services. And so we're working with them to make that just as smooth, to do it as smoothly as possible with the least amount of burden on school districts. So we're gonna have to seek some additional guidance, but um, you know, that is something, I, I wouldn't call it a bombshell because it's not, it's not a huge amount of money, for us, but I do feel it's something that we do need to, that we do need to do. I look forward to the day when I can say $18 million is not a lot of money. Thank you for your time. It is a lot of money in salute, I tell you, but you know, <laughs> millions here and that's B word. So, but thank you. I understand what you're saying. Thank you.
Dr. Coleman, I'd yes. like to address Superintendent Spearman's question there just, um, from a moment ago, and that was about uh, how do we convince folks that it's safe to come back to school? And my personal opinion on that is, is that the school principals, the nurses, the uh, PTA presidents, SIC presidents, those are the key influencers that are going to determine who comes back to school. Uh, certainly we can do messaging at a broader level, at district or state level, but they're looking to the folks that they entrust their kids to every day to give them that reassurance that it's safe to come back. And so I think by having those folks engage uh, with, with their personal connections, uh, doing virtual tours of the school on social media. We've had great luck putting out some videos here that have uh, been very helpful with that to show folks what we're doing, the precautions that are being taken. And but I think it's got to start at that grassroots school level. Molly, I want to take, I want to take one more hit at the horse. Dr. Coleman, can I take one more? Absolutely. The best advertising you can do for families is to have a successful summer school program. So go back and get the funds that we need to run our programs, because if we can do it successfully this summer, then we can do it in the fall. That's a good point. Thank you. You're right. Thank you. Any other, any other comments or questions? Just to add to what Alan said about utilizing administrators. Um, it probably is a good good to utilize the teacher leaders as well. Um, some of the district teachers of the year um, and the state teacher forum to help out with that messaging uh, as well. That's an excellent point. And I know that um, you had a communications, I know you have a communications piece in there, I think. Um, Patrick does. So um, I think we can incorporate some of these comments into that if that's the desire of the task force. Everyone good with that? Okay. All right. Any other questions or comments? All right. What I'd like to talk about now is our next steps. Um, and as Superintendent uh, Spearman has has mentioned that um, she's been asked to present a plan for our summer programs uh, to a Senate committee next week on Wednesday. And um, also I know she needs to um, uh, give some information to Accelerate SC on Tuesday. So uh, given the need for these recommendations uh, to be final in order for her to consider them and present them, um, I'm, I'm, what I'd like to do is ask for a consensus among the task force members to share this as a draft uh, with our stakeholders, our associations and groups, and with the public. Um, and if there's any um, objection to these recommendations that, that we can, we will certainly be happy to, to note them in the minutes from this group. Uh, but given the, <clears throat> excuse me, given the short time frame, um, what I'd like to do is, is um, ask that our stakeholders and, and public to provide us feedback by Monday at, at five so that we can approve a final document um, and have our task force hopefully meet on Tuesday morning. Um, so that's that's what I'd like to recommend at this point. Um, any comments or questions? All right. Um, so I will, um, Superintendent Spearman, um, I, I think that's an overwhelming uh, endorsement of this as a draft and that we um, we allow the staff to um, make some of ad these additional changes uh, and recommendations uh, that were made during this meeting. Um, and then we can uh, share it with our stakeholders, uh, and the public and solicit comments. Uh, and like I said, until uh, 5 p.m. on Monday, I, I know it's a short turnaround time, but I know that time is of the essence if we're gonna uh, move into this summer program. So it's critically important that we get this information to you. 
and then um, we will we will um, meet Tuesday morning uh, so that you will have a, a, a final recommendation from the task force. So, um, is there any other comments from staff from Ryan? Um, or Superintendent Spearman on that, or any member of the task force. Kathy, I, I appreciate everybody, and I know it's difficult with this being Memorial Weekend, but uh, there are a few stakeholder groups I'd like to be sure have a chance to look at this, as well as the general public giving us comments back. And I apologize that it's worked out over, over Memorial Day, but um, thank you all for agreeing to follow that procedure. I think it's really important that I'm sure everyone has a chance to come in and that I get uh, have, a, have a really good sense of what the public and our stakeholders are thinking. All right, thank you. I know um, Sherry's um, has some connectivity issues, but she's uh, asked a question in the chat box and we will uh, get that information for you, Sherry. Thank you for asking that question. All right, any other comments? All right, then um, we will adjourn uh, this meeting of the Accelerated Ed Task Force. And uh, we certainly appreciate, um, I, I just can't thank you enough for this group for their hard work and also the staff and our advisory groups. Um, and, and I appreciate the, the um, sincerity of and the great thought that went into these recommendations to this point. And, and uh, as we work over the weekend and get input, we appreciate uh, the comments we'll receive and uh, we, will, um, we will make note of our next meeting as soon as we're able to. So any other comments? Thank you all so much. Have a great evening.